When you think about heaven, how do you picture it? Actually, do you picture it as one place? That might be a little bit presumptuous, so that's typically what most people think. The Bible actually says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Heavens? Yep, plural. More than one. So what does that mean? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But back to my original question, how do you picture heaven? There are surely places in the heavens that are like green meadows next to still waters, and I guarantee you that's true. But there are also places that are like hardened battlefields. In the heavens, there's a time and a place for the harp, and there's a time and a place for the blowing of the shofar. What causes these battles, this collision between good and evil? Well, actually, a lot of the time, you do. More specifically, your prayers do. How? That's the mystery. The mystery of spiritual warfare. This is Dreams and Mysteries with John Paul Jackson. You may have never heard of spiritual warfare, but one way or another, all prayer is in fact spiritual warfare. In this way, even though you can't see it, when you pray, you've ignited a war, a, a fray of warfare, in fact. You've called on an airstrike. You've asked God to come in and strike from the air. You've enabled God to answer that prayer through whatever sovereign act he sees fit. He can command his angels to render aid. He can respond through the work of the Holy Spirit. He can move upon the heart of a man, changing his direction. Prayer can cause God to send signs, wonders, or miracles your way. Prayer can do all these things and countless others. Your prayers cause God to act and the enemy to react. This spiritual realm, because of your prayer, becomes a super highway of collisions between good and evil. This is the place that Jesus was describing when he said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. There is a constant battle going on in the invisible world all around you. Even though you may not know it or even see it, it still exists. Not only is it going on all around us, you and I have a part to play in that very battle. God created us to be part of that battle the moment he told us to subdue the earth. We chose to make that job just a little bit harder at the fall, but the mission remains the same. We are to overcome evil with good. God is waiting to help us do that very thing, but he won't act without us asking. All prayer is asking, and all prayer in one way or another becomes spiritual warfare. That's why Paul, in his letter to Ephesus, encourages them to put on the full armor of God. That's not a physical armor because we're not battling against flesh and blood. The full armor of God consists of spiritual tools necessary to defend ourselves when we're being attacked by the enemy. This allows us to press forward on the offensive when it takes place on the ground. The sword, the breastplate, the helmet, the shield, the belt, the shoes, these are what you take out with you to the battlefield when you pray. Paul's not mentioning the arm of God as some sort of poetic allegory or metaphor. Paul is clearly seen into this invisible realm and he knows it's no picnic. He asks God for battle instructions and he's passing those instructions along to us. This is all part of the divine irony of spiritual warfare. That's why we quietly, and peacefully pray, and all that time, the battle rages on all around us. You are not here to be average. You are here to change the world. You are here to take part in the miraculous. In the Spiritual Living series, listen to John Paul Jackson as he teaches you about the impact your life will have as you become the person that God has created you to be. Inherit all of God's promises and blessings Recognize how the lives of others profoundly impact your destiny and purpose. Learn how to take risk and trust God. The Spiritual Living series includes advancing to the next spiritual level, regaining what you've lost, your great purpose, 
increasing your spirit's capacity and matters of the earth. This spiritual living series is being offered for your gift of $60 or more to the ministry. Order today at dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285. To understand spiritual warfare, it helps to first understand the structure of the heavens. So you have first heaven, second heaven, third heaven. You have the place where man lives, the place where the second heaven is, where demonic forces are, and you have the third heaven. So we get our biggest clue to this structure when Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, that he knew a man who went to the third heaven. Whether in the body or in the spirit, he really didn't know. Now think about that for a moment. The complexity of that statement alone that he knew a man that went to the third heaven. You see, that statement should be taken as scriptural proof that there are three heavens. If there's a third heaven, then there has to be a second heaven by definition, right? Now, does the Bible specifically mention a second heaven? No, not even once. But that's what makes the Bible so mysterious. There are some messages that are plain and clear, like the message of salvation. But then there are the buried mysteries, the 2 Corinthians 12, 2 mysteries, that the clue that is given to us about the rest of the heavens is given in this context that's not even referring really to that issue. So what do the scholars have to say about this third heaven stuff? There are some general arguments. The first heaven is generally agreed to to be the earth and its atmosphere. And the third heaven is generally agreed to be the abode of God, our Father, who art in heaven. But the second heaven, the second heaven is a matter of debate and often fierce debate as well. You see, there are two schools of thought on it. The viewpoint you'll see most often is that the second heaven is outer space, the space where you find the planets and the solar system. That viewpoint tends to look at the three heavens as being separated by distance. So you have first heaven, second heaven, third heaven, distance-wise. Well, I don't believe that point of view. That's a physical way of describing something that I see much more of a spiritual place, a real place, but a spiritual place, kind of like kind of like another dimension. I've heard the argument there is no such thing as a second heaven, but I can't understand that, and so I disagree with it, because if there's gotta be a third heaven, there's gotta be a second heaven. So if Paul mentions that, doesn't that say that that's the way it is? It would be like me telling a real estate agent that I'm looking for a home in the third bathroom, only to have the agent present me with a house that has two bathrooms, and then trying to tell me the house comes with a first and a third bathroom. I don't believe the second heaven is outer space. I believe the second heaven is the place that spiritual battles between angels and demons take place, a spiritual realm, maybe a spiritual dimension. The second heaven is no man's land, literally, where angels and other spirit beings must push through to reach us. They have to do that from the third heaven to reach us in the first heaven. You see, The second heaven is the heaven that God created for demonic beings to inhabit. It's the abode they left in Genesis when they found the daughters of men pleasing. Lastly, the second heaven is a battlefield, but it's not our battlefield. The battlefield belongs to God. He tells us this much in Psalms 115 verse 16 when the psalmist writes, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth He has given to man. There is a battlefield that we belong on and that we should report to every day. But there are also other battlefields that we have no place or no authority entering. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by we can go some battlefields but not other battlefields? Well, here's what I mean. When we engage the enemy in the second heaven, our safety cannot be guaranteed because we're leaving our abode, the earth. What do I mean by second heaven battle? When you pray against or you rebuke a principality or a power over a region, you're leaving your realm of spiritual authority because the Lord says the heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's. Not man's, they're the Lord's. So in my book, Needless Casualties of War, I tell the story after story of pastors and churches that have endured spiritual attacks against their families. The one common denominator that they have is that they were engaging in second heaven warfare. 
I never would have made this connection if it weren't for a dream that I had. The dream that clearly defined my perspective on spiritual warfare actually came at night. The sky was an incredibly blue, black, huge horizon, and on this huge horizon was an even larger luminous moon that filled nearly the entire sky. There were figures silhouetted between me and the moon, and these figures were beginning to rail the moon. They began to shout at the moon, and as they began to shout at the moon, these platforms they were standing on and preaching from began to just kind of rise up off the ground. As they began to rise up, more and more people would gather around them. The more people that gathered together, the more the platforms would rise. Finally, as that kept happening, I was getting closer myself and I began to realize they had something on their hips, kind of like gunslingers. And all of a sudden, they began to take the, the holster on their hip and they began to throw it at the moon. And what they threw was a hatchet. They just simply threw a hatchet at the moon. Well, the, the hatchet had no chance of hitting the moon, and it just literally went into the distance and the darkness beyond. But the people applauded, and the people that, that were on the platforms, the platforms continued to rise. As that happened, they began to get tired. They began to get weary. And they began to lay down from their fatigue on their platform, and they fell asleep on that platform. It was then that something really, really undetected happened. I could see it, but they couldn't see it because they were asleep. Figures began to drop from the moon to the earth. Only this could happen in a dream, but dreams tell us so much. Figures dropped from the earth. They were dark figures. They dropped to the earth. They began crawling up the pole, which held up the platform that these people were standing on that had been yelling at the moon, throwing hatchets at the moon. Soon, when the, these demonic forces climbed over the edge, I heard these blood-curdling cries that came from these leaders. Cries for their family, cries for their children, cries for their churches, cries for the ministry. They were saying, somebody help me, somebody help me, I'm dying, somebody help me, my children, somebody help me. It was a terrifying, horrible, sight and an even worse sound. Then, like a movie, the dream faded to black. And in the stillness that followed, God spoke to me. And this is what he said. To attack principalities and powers over a geographic area is as useless as throwing hatchets at the moon. And it leaves you open to unforeseen and unperceived attacks. Unforeseen. That's what happened to these pastors. They were asleep. These leaders, they were asleep, unperceived. They thought something was attacking them, okay, but they had no clue why or how or who. Unforeseen and unperceived attacks. God's word echoed in my mind. These leaders didn't see anything coming. They didn't see the principalities. They didn't see the counterattacks. They believed they were doing something great for God, but they failed to comprehend the nature of the enemy's authority to retaliate with fierceness because they had left their God-given authority and gone into an arena they had no authority to go into. Made a little lower than the angels, they decided they were going to attack demonic powers that were equal in their structure and in their created order to the angels. The Lord then went on to also say one more thing to me, and he told me to read Job 41 and Isaiah 27 concerning Leviathan and who has been given responsibility over the attacking or taking Leviathan and the dangers of attacking Leviathan when you don't have the authority given to you by God to do it. God has the authority. He has not given that authority to man. Well, this gave me, as I mentioned, gave me courage. And the courage was basically this. I had pastors who had been calling me, asking me, what is going on in my church? I've had five women that have miscarried. I've got four more women that are spotting. I've had five, the five that miscarried all miscarried in the same month. And now these other four women are about to miscarry. And, and they're approaching the month that the others miscarried in. And he says, what am I going to do? I had a pastor call me, well, all within in the same week. 
And they also, and the pastor said, my son has run away. My son has been incredibly uh, submissive. He's been a great son. He's in his teenage years, not a problem. A high school athlete and he's run away. I had another pastor call me. I said, my daughter has disappeared. I can't find her. I'm, I'm gonna have to go to the police. And I, she's just disappeared. And they asked me, what, can, does, has God told you anything about my church? Has God told you anything about my son? Has God told you anything about my daughter? I had others that had called me as well. And so I was seeking the Lord about that, trying to find the answer to the missing son or daughter or to the, to the, the, the miscarriages that were happening in the church. And then this dream came and I understood what had happened. So I called the pastors. The next day I got on the phone, called the pastors. I called the pastor. First pastor I called was a church up in the Chicago area. And I said, brother, have you been doing anything? Have you been like coming against principalities and powers? He goes, yeah, man, we've been really going after them. We're coming against the spirit of abortion in the city, sexual perversion in the city. We're really pulling them down. And I said, that's the reason why your women have lost their babies. That's the reason why the four women are spotting. And if you'll repent of that, and I went into the dream, told him the dream, gave him the Bible verses. We talked a little bit about it, talked about the Hebrew passages, the five things that we talked about earlier. We talked about those, and I said, if you'll repent, God will stop the spotting that's going on in the women right now. The women within 24 hours will stop the spotting, and they will go full term, have their babies, and all four of the babies will be healthy. But you've violated the authority structure that man had been given by God. I then called the pastor that had the daughter that was missing and the son that had run away. And in talking with them, I also asked them the same thing. And they had been doing the exact same thing. They had exceeded their authority structure. They had rebelled against God's created order. They had rebelled on what God had given man to do. And in the process, the Lord spoke to me and said, their children also rebelled. Just as they had rebelled against God's order, the Father in heaven's order, the children had rebelled against the Father on earth's order. There, so there was this metaphor going on. Talked to them what had happened and told them, if you'll repent of, of doing these things, your son will be back home in 24 hours and your daughter will turn up in 24 hours and everything will be fine. They believed it, they've repented, and that's exactly what happened. To the church that had the miscarriages, the next morning by noon, all the women had reported everything was fine. They went on to have healthy babies. The daughter that had disappeared had come back home. The son that had run away had come back home. Everything was fine. And years later, everything was still fine. What I found is that God is really serious about what he has given us to do and what he has do. Yes, we will have one day the authority to judge angels, absolutely. But that's in the age to come, Ephesians 2, 7 tells us. It's not in this age. When we exceed the authority that God's given us, then the enemy has an avenue of attack that he never had before. Over the last 30 years, John Paul Jackson has studied how God speaks metaphorically through dreams, parables, and proverbs in the Bible. God wants all believers to understand their dreams, and that includes you. For your gift of $60 or more, we'd like to send you the Season 2 Dream Bundle, a two-CD set teaching the basics of dreams and visions. John Paul's advanced six-CD set, Understanding Dreams and Visions, and a three-CD set on the biblical model of dream interpretation also included the Moments with God Dream Journal, plus four dream cards to help you understand your dreams. Order your Season 2 Dream Bundle today. Visit dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285. Spiritual warfare isn't anything that you or I should be afraid of. You have to have faith in God, and you have to have faith that you are a son or daughter of God, and you have been given tools of warfare. You were made to pray for the sick, and the result of that prayer should be that they are healed. You were created to pray for the demonized, and the result should be that they were delivered and set free. You were made to pray for the brokenhearted, 
And the result of that should be that the hearts become mended through the power of the Holy Spirit. This is all spiritual warfare. You're doing what you were created to do. Destroy evil with good, but all this warfare is what I call terrestrial warfare, earthly warfare, first heaven warfare. It's all done here on earth. The demonic presence you're commanding to leave a person is here on earth. God has given the earth to man, but not just the physical earth, it includes the first heaven as well. The first heaven is the spiritual dimension that exists right here around us, the spiritual reality, this coexisting spiritual realm. When a person is demonically oppressed, that spiritual being is in our jurisdiction, the jurisdiction we've been given to rule. However, a power or principality located over a geographic area is an entirely different matter. That is a second heaven entity, second heaven. Then the Bible is clear that we should leave those beings to God. That's not to say we stand by and do nothing. It simply means we address our prayers to God and ask God to change things. Here's the difference. You can rebuke the spirit of abortion over a, a woman who is having a miscarriage or being, being taken along that direction, but you can't rebuke the principality of abortion that's over a particular city. So to be completely frank with you, that principality over a city has a right to be there over that city until the hearts of the people of that city are changed. And that's exactly how you wage spiritual warfare against powers and principalities. You pray for God to change the hearts and minds of the people in charge of those cities. When the high places in the natural realm are changed, the second heaven powers and principalities are removed and godly powers and principalities are set up. That's exactly what Jeremiah 17 is talking about. When a city does right, God removes the evil. When a city does wrong, God places evil in charge. It's our hearts that determine what rules in the second heaven. We don't tear it down unless we tear down the high places in our own hearts. So perhaps the hardest part of the mystery of spiritual warfare is to grasp what Ephesians 6, 12 is really saying. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Everything Paul is mentioning in this passage exists in the second heaven. The context of Ephesians 6 is to pound home the importance of putting on the armor of God and having done that, stand your ground. But where do you stand your ground? You stand it right here on earth. The armor of God prepares us for spiritual warfare. In truth, we do wrestle with Satan's infantry every day. We don't wrestle with Satan himself. The main point to Ephesians 6, 12 is to stress the need to prepare ourselves for battle. And that battle comes through demonic forces driving and, and pushing people that come against us and what we're called to do. We prepare through the knowledge of the Word of God. We prepare by increasing our faith. We prepare by maintaining an atmosphere of peace, along with the understanding of truth and righteousness, and of course, with the realization that Jesus has saved us from the everlasting effects of hell, a place that was created for Satan and his minions, not for humans. The only way that we go to hell is because we choose to follow Satan, and when he follows into the pit, we go right after him because we follow him blindly along the way. Learn how to protect yourself from unforeseen and unperceived spiritual attacks in the battle of the millennium. The Dynamic Prayer Series includes two of John Paul's best-selling books. In his book, Needless Casualties of War, John Paul unravels the subtle distinctions between waging warfare against the enemy and becoming an unnecessary casualty of war. In Unmasking the Jezebel Spirit, John Paul speaks with wisdom and authority, pinpointing exactly where the enemy is operating. Also included, a two CD set on effective spiritual warfare. John Paul reveals some startling insights that will uncover spiritual strategies of the dark side. For your gift of $30 or more to the ministry, we will send you Needless Casualties of War, Unmasking the Jezebel Spirit and Companion CD. Or for your gift of $50 or more to the ministry, we will send you an audio version of the books and Companion CD. 
Order today at dreamsandmysteries.com or call 1-800-538-5285. You want to learn the deeper mysteries of God, but feel overwhelmed with your schedule. Introducing John Paul's online classroom. Attend his classes without leaving your home. Explore subjects like dream interpretation, hearing from God, living the spiritual life, prayer and spiritual warfare. To begin your journey, go to dreamsandmysteries.com and click on John Paul's online classroom or call 1-800-538-5285. God created you as both a physical and spiritual being. Through His Son, Jesus, He placed in you the very DNA of deity. John calls this his seed, and Peter calls this the nature, the divine nature of God. He's given you spiritual gifts and attributes to operate in both the physical and spiritual worlds simultaneously. How does that work? By exercising the gifts God's given you and the rights you have as a son and daughter of God. Every time you pray, you're exercising those rights. Every time you lay hands on someone who is sick and ask God to heal them, you're using the tools God has given you. Those tools just aren't plain tools, they're weapons. And you've been given the right to use those weapons to destroy the work of the evil one. They don't destroy the evil one, but they they do destroy his works. That task of destroying the evil one is left to God. You may not consider yourself an evil destroyer, but you are. And everywhere you go, just your presence causes the enemy to rethink his battle plans. When you walk into a bank, the dark spiritual beings of greed and manipulation are instantly aware of your presence. They see your spiritual armor. They see your breastplate, which identifies you as a follower of Christ and as someone who can instantly make them leave if they so much as make a peep. These dark beings become agitated at your presence, at what you might do. You keep them at bay. Will you pray for the teller who's battling depression, they're wondering? Will you treat the angry security guard with kindness and begin dismantling the tense atmosphere these evil beings have spent all morning trying to build up inside of them? What are you going to do, they wonder? Why are you here? This is the battlefield you walk through each day, and most aren't even aware of it. You weren't created to tiptoe around in this battlefield you were created for the battle. Remember the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. All prayer in one way or another is spiritual warfare, but is all prayer equal in its effectiveness? Never focus on a lower power, never focus on a lesser power because God, the greatest power is the one who answers your prayer. Why focus on something that has less power than the ultimate power source, the one true God? What should be our focus during prayer? Are the things we should pray for and other things we shouldn't pray for? Is it possible that we're simply praying wrong and because we pray wrong or amiss, God is not hearing us? The answer is yes. Not all prayers are equal. There are vital principles that must be understood about prayer before you can expect your prayers to have maximum impact. But that, that type of prayer is a mystery for another time.